Greetings, Team Adulam. Karibuni sana tena. So happy to have you here. Now, today we are starting a new series on the book of Daniel. I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited about this. Now, listen, I know that I had said that we were going to do uh, uh, this year, we're going to be doing the New Testament, but you know, here we are <laughs> in the book of Daniel, an Old Testament book. Um, I feel like this is where God is leading us in terms of being able to study this book. Um, and I'm so excited about it, mostly because I love studying books. I, I, I'm, I'm more of an expository uh, teacher than I am a topical uh, uh, teacher. So I prefer actually teaching on uh, on books, uh, the books of, 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 the, of the Bible and being able to understand what it is that God is saying to us. And so I'm super excited about the book of Daniel, which is such a rich, rich book. And I hope that even as we go through this, it's not a long book. That we go through this series that you yourself would actually take the time to study this book if you are um uh, you know regularly studying the scriptures i'd encourage you to actually begin to study the book of daniel during the time that we're doing the series so that at least during the time as the last series hearing and obeying god you're hearing god and so it'll be super exciting that god will be teaching us together um on this book so as you are studying it I will be teaching on it as well and it will be like oh my gosh this is the same thing that god said to me it's super dope experience so i hope that you will as we start this series that you will also start to study the book of daniel as well yes yes so this is such an exciting book i am so so pumped to be studying this book there's two things that really vividly stand out to me about this book um and I'm sure there's, there are so many things about this book that we can learn from. So many things that we're going to go through. And again, like most series, I have no idea how long this is going to take. <laughs> you know, we could, we could stay on one chapter for like four weeks. But I don't think so. But anyway, let's see. But, 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 there's two things that really vividly stand out to me about this book. And the first thing is this, is the absolute sovereignty of God. The absolute sovereignty of God over the affairs of men. That in spite of what this world looks like, and in spite of what is going on in this world, God is very solidly in control. And this book shows us that. And we're going to talk a lot about this in just being able to show that God is the sovereign God. He is in control. And he is solidly on his throne. Has not been replaced he is on the throne, running and overseeing the affairs of the entire universe, both heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. Hallelujah! And the second thing is this, is that this book, what it does is that it reveals to us in a very literal and figurative sense how we ought to live as believers in this fallen world. How are we supposed to live as believers? When you look at this book and we look at Daniel and his friends, Daniel and his friends are a great representation of how it is that we ought to live as believers in a fallen world, right? And we're going to look um, into that um, uh, quite a bit as we go through this series. Is these two very kind of like strong themes that come out from this book, and I'm super excited about this. Now, the way that this book starts is by painting a context of what was going on at the time. What was happening during this time um, when we start to read about the story of Daniel and his friends. Um, what was going on at this time? And in Daniel 1 from verse 1 to 2 it reads, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, the book had Nezah, king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Now, it's important for us to pause here for a moment and really to dive into this and being able to reflect on what is happening here, because this is kind of a big deal. Right? This is a huge deal, actually. Right? In fact, this is undoubtedly one of the most important moments in Jewish history. What is happening right here. Right? Now, the entire national structure of the kingdom. Right? At this point in time, Israel has split into two. So there's Israel and there's Judah. Right? And so Jerusalem right now was in 
was uh, was in Judah, and Jerusalem is the epicenter of. In a sense, when you think about this is where the Solomon's temple was, and so Jerusalem is, in a sense, the center and the, and, and the epitome of the kingdom, right? In terms of the structure of the kingdom, in which in itself was ordained by God himself. And the thing that we see here is that we see this city, Jerusalem, literally crashing down the city of God crashing down and the thing is is that this event fulfilled centuries of what was prophetic warnings and hundreds of years of tradition culture and the history were literally destroyed in just one year in just one year when we're talking about like the rich history when you're talking about when we go all the way by abraham uh, give you such a nation when you go by abraham isaac and jacob jacob being israel israel david the kingdom samuel david uh, um, if, you, if you look at uh, solomon in terms of just the rich history around this literally all this that has come to be is destroyed in just one year this was the day of the lord and it left the people absolutely devastated in fact when you read the book of lamentations it's literally that the lamentations because it gives us some of the sobering realities of what was happening at the time with the israelites this was a devastating moment a devastating moment for this um, for the, in, in regards to the history of these people and the thing is this, is why this was so devastating is because up until this time, no one had been able to destroy Jerusalem. Why? Because God was, this was literally the city of God. Like God would defend this city. No one was capable of destroying this city. I mean, there were battles that were fought that would see the city being looted. But no one had been able to completely destroy Jerusalem and its great temple. No one had been able to do this. God would defend the city. In fact, there's a story in 2 Kings 18 where the king of Assyria, great mighty army, great, great mighty army, had come and set his, its, its, its gaze upon Jerusalem and had besieged it, right? In terms of they had come and they had surrounded the city and were ready to attack the city. Right? And so the king of Assyria had sent his armies, they were ready to attack the city. And what he did is that before attacking the city, he sent a threatening letter to King Hezekiah telling him to give in. Telling him, I want you to give in. Okay? I want you to surrender to me. Right? You don't need to attack this player, you surrender. Right? And, 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 he, and this letter was such a scathing letter that basically was telling Hezekiah that, listen, my guy, there is no, you, you're telling me about your God. There is no God who can come and stop me. I have destroyed all the gods, all these two other kingdoms and their gods. I have destroyed their cities. So it should be no different for you. And so he begins to scoff at King Hezekiah, saying to him, my guy, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? Why are you trying to defend this place? And yet you don't know, you don't know who I is, right? saying that God will not be able to save him from his army. And I love the prayer that King Hezekiah of Judah prayed after receiving these threats from the Assyrians. And allow me to read it from 2 Kings 19, from 14 to 19, where he says, Hezekiah, it says, Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Now, this is the letter from, um, from the king of Assyria. And it says, Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words of the Sennacherib. Has that, that the, the word Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. 
And it says that God heard Hezekiah's prayer and sent this message to Hezekiah. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. And it says that that same night that the Lord killed, that an angel of the Lord that the Lord sent an angel who killed 185,000 Assyrians. 185,000 soldiers were killed. Assyrian soldiers were killed to the extent that they immediately retreated from Jerusalem. They woke up the next morning and found all these guys dead and bounced. <laughs> they were like, hey, my guy, this place, I don't know what it is. but And literally what God said happened. God literally defended this city and he did this time and time again. This was what God would do. There was literally no army, no plan, no will of man that could stand against the living God because God defended this city. God defended this city. However, now in the case of the Babylonian invasion that we read in the first in, in Daniel, in this introduction, why this is such a powerful thing that's happening here, why this is so mind-blowing, is because when we study in the book of Jeremiah, the thing that happens, because Jeremiah is also there, he's also like a part of the um, this moment where Jeremiah was the one who came and was literally warning the people, crying out to the people and saying to the Israelites in Judah that their rebellion against the Lord would be to their detriment that God had set his sights on destroying the city and they would not believe him they literally would not believe him because they're like my guy uh, God God has always been here he's been our defense bro no one has been able to do anything for in terms of coming against this city you know what I'm saying no one has been able to do that you know God 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 God's got us but the thing is, is that they did not realize that their rebellion against him, because now all of a sudden that this city of God had become a haven for idolatry. And God was displeased with this. And he continued to tell the people that I am coming against you and I will destroy this city. And Jeremiah kept warning the Israelites, telling them that their rebellion against him was to their detriment. And so the thing is that their people, they continued in their rebellion. And it literally led to God resolving that the city of Jerusalem and its great temple, which, we, which he himself had commissioned, would be destroyed and that the people would be sent into exile. Like I told you, this place had become a haven for idol worship. And the thing is that God resolved that he was going to destroy the city and rebuild it afresh at a later date. If you, fact, if you recall, when we studied the book of Haggai, that was what was happening. This was now in the book of Haggai where they are rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians, right? And so it's important for us to understand that the person who is destroying Jerusalem, the person who is destroying the city, the person who destroyed the, te the great temple, it wasn't the Babylonians. It was God who had who was behind this destruction. This wasn't the will of the Babylonians because no one had been able to stand against this city because God would not allow it. But now it says, and you saw when we read it, it says that he handed them over to the Babylonians. He handed them over to the to, to this Babylonian, uh, the Babylonian kingdom, which at the time was the most powerful kingdom on earth. And so he hands them over. And that this was God's will for his people, that they would be sent into captivity in Babylon on account of their rebellion against him. Them being sent into exile was under the hand of God. This wasn't the will of the enemy. The, the, the Babylonian enemy was literally, in essence, being used by God to bring judgment on the Israelites for their rebellion. You know, in Jeremiah 21 from verse 1 to 10, it reads that the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him. Right. So now what happens here, in fact, before I, before I read this, is that King Zedekiah again is like, ah, my guy. See, God has been the guy who has been, 
he's been defending us nini you know and now he is the king of babylon who's coming against us and king zedekiah is just like yo tell 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 uh, jeremiah to just talk to god eh? atufanyie vile alikuwa anatufanyia you know what i'm saying now this is that part just so that i can paint some context around that in terms of like ah god he's going to come through he's going to come through it says here that the word came to jeremiah from the lord when king zedekiah sent to him pashur son of machija and the priest zephaniah son of Mas- masaiah they said inquire now of the lord for us because nebuchadnezzar king of babylon is attacking us perhaps the lord will perform wonders for us as in times past so that he will withdraw from us but jeremiah answered them tell zedekiah this is what the lord the god of israel says i am about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands which you are using to fight the king of babylon and the babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you and i will gather them inside the city i myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm in furious anger and in great wrath I will strike down those who live in this city both man and beast and they will die of a terrible plague after that declares the Lord I will give Zedekiah king of Judah his officials and the people in this city who survived the plague sword and famine into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and to their enemies who want to kill them he will put them to the sword and he will show them no mercy or pity or compassion Furthermore tell the people this is what the Lord says see I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death whoever stays in the city will die by the sword famine or plague but whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live and they will escape with their lives I have determined to do this city harm and not good declares the Lord it will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon and he will destroy it with fire This was God's plan to send them into exile. He had sent them warning after warning after warning for them to reject the rebellion against him. And finally the day of the Lord came. The day that the Lord sent the prophets, many prophets to come and warn the people about came. That day of judgment came. That God had warned time and time and time and time again. it came and this is where this book starts in showing us that the god who judges the god who judges is very very real and that this was a moment when his judgment had come now the question is where am i going with all this where am i going with all this like great great context great context one of the tactics of the enemy is to blind us from two realities that god is love and that this same god is also a holy righteous judge it is these very aspects of god's nature that are the reason why jesus came literally they are the bedrock of his mission as savior where it says in john 3:16 that for god so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life the goal of the enemy is to blind us from why jesus came and further to minimize the impact of christ's mission and message to us and the thing is is that today i want to spend some time as we start this series to remind us of why god sent us a messiah in jesus christ i want us today to remember and to be reminded why it is and what it is that he came to save us from what did jesus when you say we are, you know I'm, i'm saved saved from what i want to remind you why the gospel is such great news it's not just good news it's great news the good news of the gospel the great news of the gospel and this book interesting enough just like everything every single thing even as you read the book of daniel as you go through the book i want you to understand that every single thing points to christ every single thing written in the scriptures is about pointing to christ and so it's the same with this book right now the thing is is that all of scripture tells us and even jesus himself tells us that god the creator of heaven and earth 
the creator himself has laid out a plan where he intends to get rid of all rebellion against him. He has laid out this plan and he has spoken of it from the very beginning. That we are told that the world as we know it now in its current form is going to be done away with. The apostles in the New Testament tells us of this time. Right? So, if we, for example, like the Apostle John in John, 1 John 2, 15-17, he says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. And this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 29-31, where he says, From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they do not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if, they were, as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. What we hear and what we read and what we are told through and through the scriptures is that the holy and just creator, the holy and just creator of heaven and earth has determined that he will do away with sin and evil once and for all. And a time is coming when him in his sovereign will as the creator of all things, that he will judge heaven and earth. So you have had it asked many times, why would a good God allow evil to thrive? But the reality is this, that evil has been judged. A time is coming when we will see the sentence that God has towards evil. We have had it many times where Jesus would talk about Literally, when we talk about the thing of like, why would hell exist? Hell exists because we have a creator who is a righteous judge who says that he will judge evil and sin, that he will do this and that a time is coming. You know, the thing that is so interesting and is so saddening is that for many of us, for so many of us, And this is part of the reason why God sends us out is because for so many of us, we live our lives as though this is not going to happen. The same way that these people did in Israel before the Babylonian uh, judgment came. Where they were just like, ah, God's got us, man. Let's just stay in our rebellion. God's got us, right? He's he's going to, he's, 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 he's so loving and he's so kind, he's so patient. But that day is going to come and that time is coming. And what's interesting is this, is that even in as much as we and many times many people live as though this is something that is not true. But the thing that is so interesting, even in the scriptures, even the demons know that this time is coming. In Matthew 8, 28, 29, it says that when he, Jesus, arrived at the, on, at the other side in the region of Gadar, 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 Gadarenes. <laughs> Two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. And then they said, What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? So the demons know that there is an appointed time. When their judgment will be executed. I know it's so interesting, even before, I, even before I talk about that. Like, it's so interesting that even the demons know that this guy is the son of God. So the demons know that Jesus is the son of God. And they also know that there is an appointed time. And so what they do is that until then, they are roaming around deceiving and entrapping people. Causing them to be blind to this reality that there is a time. There is an appointed time that God has set where his judgment will be executed. And they know it. Jesus says in John 16 from verse 5 to 11 that, But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? 
But because I have said these things to you, grief has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I am leaving. For if I do not leave, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. Regarding sin, because they do not believe in me. And regarding righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will no longer and you, you no longer are going to see me. And regarding judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. And so the thing is, is that this day has been set and the judgment has been made. God, the creator of all things, has determined, has said that he is going to punish and do away with the rebellion of his own creation against him. This has already been determined. And this is why Jesus was sent to be the only saving hope against God's judgment. You know, the thing that is so interesting about this is, is that it's actually a legal process. You know, when you talk about God's judgment and the fact that God is a righteous, holy judge, this is actually a legal process that we're talking about, right? So usually in a legal, in, in, a, in, a, in a criminal case, right? In the process, the legal process of a criminal case, what happens is that first you are arrested, right? So you commit a crime, whatever, or a crime is committed, uh, you are arrested, and then you're taken to court for your hearing, right? Once you're taken to court for your hearing, once the hearing is done, what happens is then there's a judgment that is made to say whether you are guilty or not guilty, right? Now, if at any point there's a determination of guilt that is made, right, then the next and final phase of the process is what is called sentencing. So meaning that when, a judgment, when the judgment is made, there's still another period, there's still another process that needs to be followed and that process is called sentencing right and what sentencing is is where the judge decides how to sentence the defendant all right now allow me to read this excerpt i found from a u.s law firm regarding this process in terms of trying to help us understand what this sentencing process is about now it says here that the sentencing phase of a criminal case is conducted after a determination of guilt is made a determination of guilt can be made in several ways. A defendant can changes their plea and enters into a plea agreement and that is a determination of guilt right there. If a defendant goes to trial and is found guilty either by a jury or a judge in a bench trial, that is also a determination of guilt. So when a determination of guilt is made, a judge has to decide how to sentence a defendant. Now, under a plea agreement, that sentencing is limited by the terms of the plea agreement. If the defendant, however, is convicted at trial, that sentencing is limited by the charges that they are convicted of. Let me read that again. In what it says, it says now under a plea agreement that sentencing is limited by the terms of the plea agreement. So remember that there are two ways a determination of guilt is made. You can either accept your guilt and enter into a plea agreement or you can go to trial. And uh, uh, when you go to trial, now that's is, is now the determination of... There's no plea agreement now, it's the determination of now you are either found guilty or not guilty, all right? Now, those who refuse in now, in now bringing it back, honing it back into the understanding of why this is what, what's happening here is such a legal process, is that those who here refuse to acknowledge their guilt, who literally refuse to acknowledge their guilt, it says here, will go and face the living God. And the thing is, is that the Bible says to us that this judgment has already been made. That it says that the wages of sin is death. And it says that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So meaning that when Jesus Christ says that this, that, that this world has already been judged, 
judgment has already been made is basically saying that in the kingdom terms the that process of going to trial it's like you have nothing to stand on we've already been told what the sentencing for sin is and we've already been told that all have fallen short of the glory of god that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god in john 3 17 to 18 jesus says to us that for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son so we literally are standing in judgment the thing has already been made the judgment has already been made right the judgment has already been made that all have fallen short of the glory of God and anyone who does not believe in him has already stands condemned because if you go and stand trial before God, you will not be able to stand trial before Him. And so the thing is this, is that what Jesus did for us on the cross, is that through His own sacrifice, what He negotiated for us is a plea agreement. That entering into that plea agreement literally if you remember, what it says is that entering into a plea agreement is an acceptance of guilt. And for thus, for, for those who have accepted that indeed, that we are sinners, that we have accepted that we indeed have no standing before God, that we are guilty. And for us who acknowledge that, we are acknowledging that we are in need of saving grace and what happens is this is that what Jesus Christ has done is that through this acceptance of guilt is that he then invites us into entering into this plea agreement that he has negotiated for us on our behalf literally by his own blood that literally in this plea agreement and if you remember what it says that under a plea agreement sentencing is limited by the terms of the plea agreement so meaning that what he has negotiated for us through the cross through his blood is that he has negotiated for us a plea agreement that says that when we are coming to this plea agreement, that we are then able to be absolved of our sin and that we experience forgiveness and that we do not get to experience the judgment of God, the wrath of God, which has already been poured out on Christ Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. And so at this very moment, all of us who are alive are living in the window where we can accept God's plea agreement or reject it. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 8 to 10, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. We are told in the book of Revelation that after God is done away with rebellion, that what he will do is that from himself he will bring out a new heaven and a new earth. That he will establish an eternal kingdom where he will reign forever and he his, his, his son, Jesus Christ, will reign forever. Where it says that there will be no more death, no mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And the thing is for us to realize that since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the clock has been ticking. We have been living in a time of great mercy by our God who has already judged this world. And has said that anyone who does not take this plea agreement stands condemned. And the thing that is so interesting is that the demons know it, Satan knows it, all heaven knows it. The question is, do you know it? This is literally why Jesus came. 
He is he came in response to God's love towards us to rescue us from his own impending judgment. The righteous judge, the creator of all things, has determined that he will do away with evil once and for all. And what he has determined is that he has come and he has established before us a process through which we are able to escape that judgment through a plea agreement negotiated by us, for us, by the living and glorious blood of the Lamb. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who has negotiated for us a plea agreement that allows us to be able to literally escape God's judgment and avoid his judgment. The thing is, is that the book of Daniel literally begins with showing us God's judgment in play, that we serve a God who is love, but who is also a holy and righteous judge. You know, it's so interesting that actually the name Daniel in Hebrew means God is my judge. And this is where we are starting this series. In helping us understand that as we face this God whom we love, and recognize that this same God is a judge. That it is part of who he is. That his holiness demands of him. That he would be a righteous judge. And indeed he is. And he has said. And he has determined that there will come a time. And he has already established that ooh, this world. Literally we're in the, what we are calling the sentencing period. <laughs> the period between judgment has been made. And sentencing. And in between here, we are able to negotiate a plea agreement. And that plea agreement has already been negotiated on our behalf. That Jesus Christ went and literally died on the cross and shed his own blood and signed that agreement on our behalf where he has said that all who believe in me will not perish but have everlasting life. And all we have to do is accept and believe in Jesus Christ, all we have to do is accept this plea agreement. And to me, I keep saying, and I'm just like, what great news. This is why the gospel is such good news. It's not so that you can be able to get that house, that car, that her, that her. The reason why this gospel is great news is because Jesus has literally demonstrated to us unfathomable grace unfathomable grace and mercy you know the thing is is that our lives are literally like a grain of sand like when you think about the length of our lives in the context of eternity it's like a grain of sand at the beach <laughs> in the context of eternity right but for those of us who have put our faith in Christ Jesus I want you to know that this world pales in comparison to what God has prepared for those who love him. This was the joy that Jesus valiantly died for. It wasn't for us to merely thrive in this world, to get that big car, big house, to have this great. It wasn't for that. That's just the grain. It was because we would get to be a part of God's amazing future for us beyond this world. And the thing is for me is that I, you know, I'm like, how do we apply this? What, I, I'm just like, I feel like for us, as we start this series and as we go along this series, like it is so important for us to just always remember and just bask in this grace. That to reflect on this amazing grace that we have received, because sometimes you can get so caught up in the grain of sand that we forget to look at the beach. <laughs> you forget to look at the sea. Because you're so focused on this grain, <laughs> this grain. And so we live our lives without eternity in mind, without recognizing what it is that literally we have received. This is why the Bible keeps saying to us that we live in a state of being able to continually give thanks to the living God. Because we have no understanding. Sometimes we don't fully understand just the unfathomable grace that we have received in Jesus Christ. 
And this is what Jesus says to us. He says to us, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this grain of sand, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And so for over the next few weeks, as we look at this book in the book of Daniel, and how for us, it, how we live on this side of eternity, how we live in this grain of sand, right? How do we live as, in a quote and quote, and we look at this next week in terms of how we live as exiles in this world that we don't belong to. But as we spend, as, as before next week, I want us to be able to just spend time and continue to spend time just marinating on this. That for those who have put their faith in Christ, that you have received an unfathomable gift from God. Unfathomable. And one day, one day we will see it and fully be able to understand this exceedingly great gift that we have received and be so glad when we see his judgment and be like, man, we're so glad that we took that plea agreement. The thing that Christ purchased for us with his blood. Because the reality is this, that not only will we be able to escape God's judgment, it says also that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who love him. Who are those who love him? Those who love him are those who hear his words and believe them. And so for you who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to understand the depth of the grace that God has poured out into your life. But if you're listening to me, and you have not taken that plea agreement, I want you to understand today that all throughout Scripture, it speaks of this, that there is coming a time and we can see it in this world, that the righteous judge, the creator of all things, has determined that he will do away with rebellion against him. And the only way to escape that, the only way for us to be redeemed from that, this is the creator of heaven and earth, corrective, his corrective measures, he is going to do it. And the way in which we have received this tremendous grace and love from him is that he says to us that for us who put our faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, in that plea agreement that he has literally, literally signed with his own blood on our behalf for all that will believe, that we then get not only to escape his judgment, but also to experience the new earth and the new heaven that he has prepared for those who love him. He is not done with this world. This is his creation, Natai Yosha. And so for me today, I want to ask you that if you are that person, I want you today to pray this prayer with me that you have determined that indeed that you don't want to be a part of that, that you want to be a part of God's saving grace and his mission for us in this glorious place that he says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived. And so today I want you to pray this prayer with me. Because what this prayer is, is an acknowledgement that you are guilty and that you are acknowledging and accepting this grace that Jesus Christ has gone and purchased on your behalf. And so pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I accept that I am a sinner in need of your saving grace. I submit my life to you and I acknowledge that you are Lord and that you died for me and that you r resurrected that I may have life. Come into my life and use me for your glory and change me from within. I commit my life to you today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 
If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. I look forward to being able to just continue uh, walking with you through this journey. Go down into the, the comments, uh, not the comments, but over here in the caption, you'll see over there there's a WhatsApp um, uh, uh, way to be able to get us on WhatsApp. Send us a message and tell us um, if you've made this decision and we'll be able to walk this journey together with you. For those of you who have already accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, be encouraged, be uplifted. Don't be concerned about the grain of sand. Um, we serve an amazing God who has given us an unfathomable gift in Christ Jesus. God bless you guys. Koheri and see you next week. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Listen, if this message blessed you, please be sure to share it with someone whom you love. Share it with a friend, a colleague, anyone. And then also, listen, support us. Support this ministry so that we can be able to make more dope content and be able to spread this message of the kingdom to as many people as possible. And then, make sure that you subscribe. Sawa, subscribe. Subscribe, wherever the button, subscribe, subscribe. God bless you guys.